Hi, my name's Ollie, and in this Politics Explained video, I'm going to go through everything you need to know about voting behaviour in A-level politics. So that's not just all the knowledge you need to know and some really key specific examples, but also key points of analysis and the key questions you could get asked in the exam, as well as some ideas about how you could structure answers to them. So I'm going to start by looking at the parts of the specification this lesson covers. From there, I'm going to go on to the key potential essay questions and key debates um, you could get asked. I'm then going to look at key factors explaining the outcome of elections. So that's first looking at um, traditional determinants of voting behaviour, so class and social status and partisanship and how they've decreased with class dealignment and partisan dealignment. From there, I'm going to look at social or demographic factors as predictors of voting behaviour, so looking at age, region, class, education, ethnicity and gender. From there, I'm going to look at long-term issue factors um, as determinants of, determinants of election results, such as rational choice and issue-based voting, valence factors, and the wider political and social context. Finally, I'm going to look at campaign factors, so campaigns and manifestos, and then also look at the media. From there, I'm going to look at some key case studies of general elections. So you only need to know three of these for the exam, but I'm covering um, quite a lot more than that, um, so that you're able to kind of cover the ones that you've covered in class. So the 1979 general election, 1997 general election, 2010 general election, 2017 general election, 2019 general election, as well as looking at the next possible election and which factors may be important. And for all of those elections, I'm gonna kind of give an overview of the general um, election result and its impact, as well as looking at the key factors determining the outcome. So that's going back to the factors I would have talked about um, in the first part of the video. So social factors, um, rational choice, issue voting campaigns etc. So to find the PDF um, that you should be seeing there, go to the first link in the description to the Politics Explained website, where you can also find lots of resources to help you in um, your Politics A level, including um, lots of um, essay plans, um, everything you need to know, guides, um, as well as a place to sign up for tutoring and group classes if that's something you'd be interested in. So yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. So I have another video on the Politics Explained YouTube channel that covers the media, um, part of topic four of UK politics. This video covers pretty much the rest of it, right? So um, voting behaviour in the media. So case studies of three general elections. Obviously, as I said, I'm going to be covering um, two, two more than that. Um, so and looking at their results, impact on parties and government, as well as the factors explaining the outcome of these elections, including the reasons for an impact of party policies and manifestos, techniques used in their election campaigns and the wider political context of elections, then looking at class-based voting and other factors influencing voting patterns, such as partisanship and voting attachment, and then looking at social factors as well, so gender, age, ethnicity and region as factors influencing voting behaviour, turnout and trends. And then looking at national voting behaviour patterns for these elections revealed by the national data sources and how and why they vary, and that's in, in the first part of the video. So in terms of the key debates you could get asked in relation to voting behaviour, um, they're in relation to the reasons for election results and the relative importance of different factors. So you could also get questions about the relative importance of certain specific factors. So you could get a question just on social factors, of which is the most important social factor as a predictor of um, election results, or comparing two um, different factors. Or you can get ones which get you to consider um, all of the factors. If you practice a few of the questions in bold um, on the next page, um, including paragraphs on lots of different factors, this should prepare you well for the exam. So for example, if you get a question, evaluate the view that media support is the most important factor for a political party to achieve success, you do a paragraph on media for and against, then a paragraph on social factors and a paragraph on the campaign, for example, or longer term issue factors. And then in another one you plan, you might want to consider the wider political and social uh, context, valence factors. So across these four plans, you should have paragraphs on pretty much every factor using the case um, studies of general election um, of general elections and general election results so that you should have most of the content in those essay plans and so that you should be prepared to revise for the exam. I'll be making um, detailed essay plans which you can purchase on the Politics Explained website um, for these um, for these essay questions um, which should kind of prepare you very well um, for the exam. So in terms of some examples, you've got kind of evaluate the extent to which general elections in the UK are lost by the government rather than won by the opposition. That one might be a little bit different where you need to use the case studies Evaluate the view that the media support is the most important factor for a political party to achieve success. Evaluate the relative importance of different demographic factors in voting behaviour. Um, in that one, that would just be focused on demographic factors or social factors. 
Um, and evaluate the extent to which election campaigns influence the outcome of the vote, where you could have paragraph and election campaigns, and then compare that to longer term factors such as social factors um, and um, like kind of longer term issue factors in order to come to a conclusion. So yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about how you can structure um, those essays at the end of the video. Um, but first, I'm going to look at the key factors explaining the outcome of elections. And starting off with traditional determinants of voting behaviour. So up until the early 1970s, voting behaviour was strongly influenced by class and social status. The majority of the working class voted for Labour, um, which is strongly associated with the trade unions and traditional blue collar industries um, such as coal, steel and textiles whilst the majority of upper and middle classes voted for the Tories, including white collar workers, including non-manual workers, business people and property owners. Class voting was um, strongly influenced by self-interest, with each party defined by protecting and representing different classes. Um, that said, this kind of class voting, though it was very much important um, in determining election results, it was never so clear cut, um, as the Tories always had a section of deferential patriotic working class support, and Labour had some middle class support, especially those who worked in the state sector. So this class voting was especially key um, from kind of the post World War II period up until um, the late 1970s. Since the 1970s, however, a process known as class dealignment has occurred, where class has began to lose its importance as a determinant of voting behaviour. That started with Thatcher, who was able to win three consecutive elections for the Conservative Party by attracting significant working class support. So it's not like she won the majority of working class votes. Labour still got the majority um, of support from the working classes, but the Conservative vote was no longer limited to the middle and upper classes, and they attracted um, some more working class voters. Blair was then able to win three consecutive elections for the Labour Party by attracting significant middle class support and reaching beyond the Labour Party traditional working class base. And they, there are a few, quite a few factors influencing this. So. Society and the economy was changing with increasing affluence, um, the declining importance of traditional blue collar industries and less pronounced differences between the classes. Whilst the parties also um, actively changed their policies to try and appeal to all classes so that they could win elections. So there's a kind of structural economic and societal change and then a change in party policy in order to try and continue to be successful and win votes. This is not to say that class is no longer important, um, for some voters, class still does remain important in determining their vote and how they vote in general elections. So it definitely has declined in importance, but for certain groups of voters, it is still important. So class used to be really important. Partisanship also used to be um, a lot more important. So in the post-World War II period, voters had strong affiliations with and attachments to political parties, which were part of voters' identities. And that was seen also in quite high levels of party membership, a lot higher than you see today. And that was influenced by family tradition, class, the workplace and the community. So a lot stronger attachments to Labour or the Conservative Party among certain voters. In the 1970s and 80s, as with class, these attachments um, began to decline um, and have continued to decline in the 21st century in a process known as partisan dealignment. There are now a lot more swing voters who are comfortable voting for either party, um, including rising minor um, parties such as um, UKIP, the Brexit Party, the Green Party, um, and also moving over to the, uh, the Lib Dems as well, who are, who are of course, have for a long time been a major party, but um, aren't one of the two main parties. Um, and yeah, and then these voters, who are swing voters, are comfortable to decide each election who they're going to vote for, rather than having kind of a strong um, sense um, of affiliation with one particular party, they're feeling comfortable with voting for any party and deciding each election based on factors such as the campaign, manifestos, leadership, etc. these balance factors, which um, I'll talk about later on in the video. So this can be seen in the large number of voters in the traditionally Labour red wall um, that switched to the Conservatives for the first time in 2019. Um, so yeah, you had a lot of voters who had always voted for Labour. Um, they would have had previously had that strong partisanship. But in the 2019 election, Brexit especially, um, convinced them to vote for the Conservatives. So you see the declining importance of those partisan identities. For some voters though, as with class, partisanship does remain important, um, such as in Liverpool, for example, um, which continues to have a very strong support for Labour. Um, I think a lot of constituencies in Liverpool have over 70% um, voter support for Labour and are some of the strongest Labour um, strongholds in the country. Yeah, In the 21st century as well, um, significant sections of the electorate 
are also apathetic. So this kind of known as voter apathy um, and disaffected by politics. And that can be seen in the de decreasing turnout and general, at general elections. So that's kind of part of the decreasing partisanship. On the one hand, you have voters who are willing to vote for, for either party and continue to vote. On the other hand, you have voters who just don't really care anymore, don't have such strong attachments to either party um, and don't care to vote. And that links into the democracy and participation um, topic of UK politics, um, where I've got quite a few videos on that on the politics explained YouTube channel. So that's kind of traditional determinants um, of voting behavior, class and partisanship. What I'm now gonna look at is social factors. So social or democratic demographic factors, um, they're referred to um, as key predictors of voting behavior. So social factors are highly useful for predicting and understanding voting behavior, but they shouldn't be seen as causal factors in themselves. Um, they ultimately um, interact with policy and with party image. So for example, older voters, so age, a key social factor. Um, so older voters or those in the Southeast region, another key social factor, feel that the Conservative Party represents them better um, and vote for them because they have policies that benefit them. So it's not like there's older people just naturally vote for a for the Conservative Party or are more likely to naturally vote for the Conservative Party. It's also linked to the Conservative Party's policies and their party image in terms of who they're seen um, among the public as representing. Social factors are likely to become less useful predictors of voting behaviour if the policies of the main parties are closer to each other and therefore don't significantly appeal to different groups. So if you have um, quite a difference between the parties in terms of policy, these policies are likely to um, rationally um, appeal to different groups um, and therefore social factors are more likely to be more important. On the other hand, if the policies are closer together um, and the thing that separates the parties is more leadership, um, competence, etc., social factors are less likely um, to be important. The social factors are less likely to kind of drive views of competence um, or leadership. So as social factors become less important, balance factors become more important. That's a kind of key point of analysis you can use. So now going into the key social factors, the first of those is age. So today, age is a very key determinant of voter choice in UK elections. In 2017, YouGov called it the new dividing line in British politics. And as we'll see later in the video, it continued to be very important in the 2019 election. This is partly linked to ho home ownership um, with a lot of older voters, um, or with older voters more likely to own a home and therefore vote for the Conservative Party as home ownership is also linked. Um, older voters are much more likely to vote Conservative whilst younger voters are much more likely to vote for the Labour or other more left-wing or radical parties such as the Greens and the SNP. So in 2019, 22% of 18 to 29 year olds voted Conservative, whilst over 60% of over 60s. So in 2019, age was a really key um, social factor in terms of predicting um, how people would vote. Crucially, turnout was also much higher among older voters, which benefits the Conservative Party and strengthens um, the kind of influence that um, age as a social factor has. So turnout among the 65 plus age group in 2017 was around 25 percentage points higher than among 18 to 24 year olds. So young people really do often fail to turn out to vote. Importantly, voters have always become more conservative as they get older. However, recent research um, by the FT is suggesting that millennials aren't following suit. So this can be really important in the future in the declining importance of age as a um, determinant of voting behavior. Um, and that's a big problem for the Conservative Party. So if as people are getting older, they're not getting more conservative, which for the millennials um, and um, Gen Z, the younger generation, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. That's going to cause a big problem for the Conservative Party, who are very reliant traditionally on older voters. This being said, there is also, we'd also have an aging society. Um, so people are also getting older. Um, so there are significantly more of those voters as well for the Conservative Party. Um, will receive. But in the long term, it's definitely a big problem for the Conservative Party. So in 1997, Blair was able to pick up many middle class seats from the Tories, including in the South East and the Middle East, in the East Midlands, their kind of key heartland. In 2010, the SNP shattered Labour's dominance in Scotland. And crucially, in 2019, the Tories broke parts of the Red Wall, um, Labour's previously connecting constituencies of dominance in the North, um, with majorities of over 20,000, um, even those really large majorities being flipped. Um, by the Conservatives. It's now helpful to understand the divide in many ways as a large city and some remaining strongholds in the north, so especially Liverpool and Manchester for Labour, uh, versus the majority of rural constituencies and towns for the Tories.
As the popularity of the Conservatives has declined with Partygate and the cost of living crisis, though, Labour looks likely to win win back many of the seats the Conservatives won in 2019, especially the Red Wall. So you can see um, potentially region continues to have a bit more impact than 2019 um, suggests, that kind of traditional year of region, um, at least. So class and social status today. So obviously we looked at how class has declined um, in importance. So but how does it have an influence today? Um, ultimately, it's of limited importance as a determinant of voting behaviour. In 2019, 42% um, in the AB category, so that's managerial um, voters, voted Conservative, compared to 78% in 1964, showing that declining importance. Whilst 34% of those in the DE category, and that's semi and unskilled um, workers or unemployed um, people who are unemployed or pensioners, voted Labour compared to 64% in 1964. Ultimately, in 2019, Labour faced a problem of not being associated with protecting the interests of blue-collar working classes anymore, especially in the context of Brexit and globalisation. In, in the context of Brexit and the Conservative Party's support for Brexit, they were able to win um, a lot of um, working-class voters who had formerly um, voted for Labour. So if class is no longer that important, um, a key social factor that, that is important now is education. So in recent elections and referendums, so especially the Brexit referendum, education has shown itself to be a key dividing line, with those with fewer formal qualifications more likely to support the Conservatives, and those with university education more likely to vote for Labour and the Lib Dems. So in the, the Brexit referendum, this was really evident, um, with those without qualifications going 75% um, support for Brexit, or those with a university degree um, had 75% so of those supported um, Remain. Similar can be seen in 2019, right, in, um, where 43% of those with a degree or higher voted for Labour, 17% um, uh, for the Lib Dems, and just 29% for the Conservatives. Whilst by contrast, the Conservative Party won 58% of the votes among those whose highest level of education was GCSE or lower, and that's according to YouGov. So with age, education is probably one of the most important um, social factors in determining the outcome of elections or predicting the outcome of elections um, today. Ethnicity and gender are also important. So white voters are more likely to vote for the Conservatives, whilst black and minority ethnic voters are much more likely to vote for Labour. So in 2019, 64% of BME voters voted for Labour, whilst just 20% voted for the Conservatives. Um, crucially, um, this potentially has a bit less impact though, because turnout is a lot lower among BME voters, and BME voters form um, quite a small part of the population in the UK, therefore it's less likely to have a significant impact in determining the result. In terms of gender, women used to be more likely to vote for the Conservatives, but now the influence of gender is marginal. There is, however, more of a difference among the young. Um, in 2017, in the 18 to 24 age group, the Conservatives won just 15% of women, but 28% of men. So obviously, among young people, the Conservatives are on the whole unpopular, um, but they are a bit more popular um, with young men. So yeah, that, they were some of the key social factors or demographic factors um, as that can be used as predictors of voting behaviour. In terms of the most important ones, as I said, age and education, um, I'd probably argue, are, are very important today. Um, region, in, in a different way to how it used to be, I think is, is pretty important, as, our, um, as is ethnicity, I think is quite a key um, predictor of voting behaviour. Um, but class is quite a key one, which used to be very important, um, but isn't so much anymore. And gender um, is continues to not be um, too important as a determinant of voting behaviour. As I mentioned at the start of this section, it's important not to see these as kind of completely causal factors in themselves. Um, as in, I'm, I don't think, um, for example, I'm a young man, therefore I'm more likely to vote Conservative. Or um, I'm white, therefore I'm um, less likely to vote for Labour. Um, different from that is how it interacts with policy and party image. Um, for example, so it's kind of older people are more likely to vote for the Conservatives, not just because um, they're older people, right? Um, it's because the Conservative Party um, is seen as representing older people and often will offer policies um, that benefit older people. So it has that interaction um, with party image and rational choice as well. Okay, so the next group of factors I'm going to look at are what I've called longer term issue factors. So this is more just to distinguish them from um, campaign factors and, and short term factors. Um, and it's just a kind of useful grouping of factors you could potentially um, use as a paragraph um, in an essay. The first one of these is 
rational choice and issue-based voting. So rational choice theory is the idea that voters behave like consumers by looking at the available options and evaluating which is the most beneficial to them. This is linked to the growth of a more educated electorate, especially with the um, rise of the internet and the kind of abundance of information online. And economics is seen as playing an important role in this. Um, and there's even a more rigid theory known as economic voting, which suggests that people simply vote out of self-interest um, for the party that will benefit them economically, potentially, um, for example, um, in relation to taxation policy. And this partly explains why home homeowners are much more likely to vote for the Conservatives and those who rent um, are more likely to vote for Labour. Though useful, the idea that voters are rational and perform cost-benefit analysis is um, kind of debatable, though, um, and probably shouldn't be taken too far. Issue-based voting is kind of can be seen as somewhat similar to rational choice theory in that it's based on policy, um, but it's different in suggesting that voters based on which party is closest to them on the policy that they deem is the most important. It doesn't necessarily have to be rational, um, even if they're not aligned with the party's other policies. And the 2019 election is a really key example of that, um, where 74% of Leave voters, so that's Leave voters in the EU referendum, voted for the Conservatives, including many of the Red Wall, who'd never voted for the Conservatives before. Valence factors are a number, another group of factors which are really important um, in determining um, election outcomes. So that's kind of leadership and competence. And valence issues are um, when there isn't significant disagreement between parties and voters, um, and voters therefore, between parties, sorry, and voters therefore choose based on which party um, they think is going to be most effective in government. So when you have little disagreement between parties in terms of policy, valence factors become more important. This was really important in 2010 um, and 2015 when there were a fewer policy difference um, between the parties. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, when valence issues are more significant, social factors are likely to be less significant. So leadership and conference. So first one of these is leadership. Um, the public image of party leaders has become more important in recent decades as politics has become increasingly personalised. Commentators also talked about the presidentialization um, of British politics since the 1979 election in, in kind of talking about a, a shift more closer to US politics. Um, with the suggestion being that UK election campaigns are increasingly shaped by voters' perceptions of leading figures, as they are in the US. And that's in part due to um, increasing media focus on leaders. Parties appreciate the importance of presenting their leaders in a good light, um, with attention given to photo opportunities that will show their, lead their leaders' human touch, as well as to um, TV debates um, in election campaigns. And leaders can be seen as really important in winning over swing voters and unifying the party. We'll see a couple of really good examples of that in the case studies later in the video. On the other hand, the influence of leaders can be overstated, as local MPs, partisanship, events, issues and social factors can be seen as more important. So you do have that key debate, especially with, with kind of local MPs. Is it the central party and um, party leaders that are important in determining votes, or actually do local issues and local MPs play a key role as well? The um, next valence factor is competence, um, and that's really linked to the performance of the current government um, in power. So how well have they done um, since the last election? Have they carried out their manifesto promises? Have they been effective managers of the economy um, and of, of the country? And voters are really able to pass judgment on their performance in power. And we'll see this in the 1997 election, um, where ever since Black Wednesday, in the autumn of 1992, straight after the 1992 election actually, the Conservatives um, wrecked their reputation of being economically competent and this lack of, um, this view of them being incompetent was quite key in the, um, the Labour Party's ability to win the 1997 election. Um, and yeah, it's not just the government, the perceived competence of um, other parties also plays a key role. And we'll see that in 2019, for example, with Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party and Jeremy Corbyn specifically being seen as quite incompetent. And then finally, we've got wider political and social context. So that's issues and events. Um, and the, a really good quote in relation to this is Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, who, when he was asked what a great, the greatest challenge was for a Prime Minister, said, events, my dear boy, events. So it's kind of a, the idea that events are really highly important in influencing the popularity of a government, determining the direction of that government, um, and therefore their electoral prospects. These can be political events such as splits within the parties or wider social and economic developments such as the performance of the economy, key natural disasters, foreign policy issues. Covid can be quite a good example of that, um, where in the 2019 election it wasn't really expected that um, Covid would dominate 
politics for the next three years. Um, however, it really did um, and dominated the public's view of the Conservative Party and the Conservative government in power, especially. So yeah, that's longer term factors um, that are different from social factors can determine, um, determine um, how people vote. Next thing are more short term factors in relation to the campaign. So campaign factors. So first of these is the campaigns themselves. And campaigns are the six week period um, before an election. And that's known as the campaign. And in this period, parties publish their manifestos and make active efforts on the ground and in the media to win over voters, including by spending significant amounts of money um, on advertising and in appearing in tea interviews, TV interviews and debates. Many voters only pay attention to politics during these election campaigns. So the kind of longer term, that's kind of counterpoint to the longer term factors um, being important. Some voters only pay attention in the run up to elections, um, especially if key events and gaffes um, happen during these campaigns, they can be seen as really important in, in changing how people um, vote. On the other hand, their importance can be overstated though, as many voters will have already made up their mind uh, prior to the election campaign, and they don't, and many voters don't make voters choices, voting choices based on short-term events and potentially make them um, due to their social factors um, or make them due to longer-term issues, and including potentially longer-term balance issues or uh, rational choice. Um, or issue voting, potentially. So manifestos can be seen as important um, um, as they give a very good indication of the shape of party policy and are highly informative and therefore they can therefore interact with kind of rational choice. Um, on the other hand, manifesto promises aren't always carried out. So they're sometimes not believed by the electorate with the um, case of the Lib Dems pledge to scrap tuition fees following the 2010 election being a really key example of that. Um, so they're scrutinised, focused on and defended heavily in the media um, during election campaigns and can therefore be seen as highly important in influencing voter choice. On the other hand, though, polling has shown that two thirds of people don't read manifestos, whilst many voters have made up their mind months or years before manifestos are released. So there are some kind of points for and against the importance of manifestos. And the final key um, factor um, in relation to determining election outcomes is the media. I've actually got a full video um, on the media on the Politics Explained YouTube channel. So I'm going to skip through the notes that you'll be seeing up there um, on this now and go to that video um, for a bit more detail on the importance of the media in influencing elections. OK, so now that we've looked at the key factors influencing um, general election outcomes, I'm going to look at some key case studies of general elections in order to kind of give key examples of these factors that you can use um, in your essays. So that's starting off with the 1979 general election. So in terms of an overview of this general election, it began 18 years of conservative rule under Thatcher up until 1990 and then under John Major until 1997. And was seen as bringing an end to the, po the period of post-war consensus. Look at the Conservative Party um, video on the um, Policy Explain YouTube channel for a bit more detail on that. It was called after Callaghan's minority Labour government lost a vote of no confidence in the House of Commons, which is the most recent time this has happened. Labour descended into a long period of left-right infighting over policy until Blair was able to reinvent the party in the 1990s. In terms of result, there was a 76% turnout, with Thatcher winning a majority of 43 and 43.6% of the popular vote. She then went on to increase that majority um, in the following two elections. Labour lost 50 seats um, and the Tories gained 62, whilst the Liberals um, received 13.8% of the vote, so a very significant portion of the vote, but that translated into just 11 seats, showing the disproportionate um, or unproportional nature of the first past the post electoral system. In terms of the key factors determining the outcome, the first one is, and probably the most important one in my view, is the social, economic and political context which was key to the victory of the Conservatives, who won despite the personal popularity of Callaghan, which compared to the personal popularity um, of Thatcher was, was quite high, so Thatcher was relatively unpopular as a leader. Um, and it's also despite tentative signs of economic improvement in the run-up to the election. Um, but it was ultimately the winter of discontent, um, which was really important in determining the Conservatives' victory. So in the early months of 1979, there was what was known as the winter of discontent, in which the government's attempts to impose a 5% limit um, on pay increases collapsed um, as a series of strikes by lorry drivers, health workers, refuse collectors, and even in one local authority, gravediggers, 
um, so you had a, this wide, big, um, um, large amount of strikes across the country, which led to a sense of national paralysis um, and led to an idea of labour incompetence. So the labour government was really seen as incompetent and unable to run the country and control the militant trade unions. The media showed images of a miserable strike-bound Britain, um, which provided the Conservatives with an irresistible theme. that The country needed a new direction and a government that could grapple with economic and social breakdown. The Conservative Party used the clever slogan, Labour isn't working, kind of referring both to the unions um, and the fact that a lot of um, people weren't going to work because they were striking, as well as to the Labour government, which they saw as um, being very ineffective. The political context, so if that seems kind of the word wider economic and social context, the political context was also important. Um, Labour looked weak as the election was triggered by withdrawal of support from nationalist parties after the result of referendums on Scottish and wealth devolution went against the government. So Labour was a minority government, so relied on the support um, of these nationalist governments in Scotland and Wales. And when the result of devolution referendums went against them, they withdrew their support which left the Labour Party with no majority and forced Callaghan to go to the country at the worst possible time for his party, directly after the winter of discontent. So social, um, economic and political context can be seen as really important to the 1979 election result. In terms of social factors, the Conservatives, as usual, dominated the upper and middle class. This is when class continued to play a really key role, um, whilst also making gains among the working class for the first time, showing that kind of slight breakdown in social factor as a determinant or beginning of the breakdown in um, so class as a determinant um, of voting behavior. So the Conservatives won 11% of C2 and 9% um, of those in the DEE category. So this suggests a slight decline in the importance of class um, and social status which was down to a number of reasons. So that was the social and political context made Labour look very weak so even a lot of working class voters didn't vote for them. Um, and Thatcher kind of was effective in actively appealing to the working class in her Essex man strategy um, with policies such as the right to buy council houses and support of small businesses proving popular. So social factors um, can be seen as maybe slightly less important um, as the um, uh, Conservative Party was able to reach out to some working class voters and win their votes. In terms of um, rational choice and issue voting, that can be seen as quite important as the Conservatives' manifesto of tax cuts and the right to buy scheme offered a radical change to voters following the post-war consensus. This being said, um, kind of Conservatives' economic um, statement and their manifesto didn't give much of an indication um, how radically Thatcher intended to move her party to the right. Um, there was no there was a mention, sorry, of returning recently nationalised industries to private hands and of removing trade union powers. There wasn't suggestion of such a radical crusade to scale down the state sector that followed. Um, and in terms of policy, both parties gave high priority to bringing down inflation. In terms of the campaign, it was relatively uneventful. Labour started way behind and made up a little bit of ground, but it ultimately wasn't enough. Um, the Conservatives adopted many of the techniques of modern advertising under the guidance of Gordon uh, Rees and Tim Bell um, with kind of very effective slogans. Um, and the use of photo opportunities with Thatcher, um, who is, for example, pictured holding um, a newborn calf and sought to present herself very effectively in the media. So overall, in terms of key points, the wider social, political and economic context was important, as was perceived competence or perceived incompetence of the Labour Party. Leadership played less of a role, so because Callaghan was a lot more popular um, than Thatcher, but still lost the election. Class remained important, but slightly less so than previously. The campaign had little impact on the result, as the Tories were already so far ahead, and rational choice and issue voting can be seen as important, as the Conservatives were offering a real change. So, moving on to the 1997 general election. In terms of an overview, um, New Labour won a landslide victory and removed the Conservatives from office for the first time in 18 years, opening the way for 13 years of Labour government, um, in which Blair was Prime Minister until 2007, and then Brown for another three years after that. In the 1997 election, the Lib Dems emerged as a significant third force in Westminster, um, and the Conservatives were really troubled by ongoing divisions, poor leadership, and an inability to appear relevant to contemporary society, and as a result, struggled to reinvent themselves for another decade until Cameron was able to do so successfully. So the kind of election had a big impact on both parties. In terms of the result, there was a turnout of 71.4%, 
and Labour won with a majority of 179, so a massive majority, and 43.2% of the vote. The Lib Dems, by contrast, received 16.8% of the vote, but just 46 seats, whilst the Conservatives had their worst election results since 1832, winning just 30.7% of the vote. In terms of key factors determining the outcome, um, one was the declining importance of class as a determinant of voting behaviour. So crucial to Labour's victory was their ability to win a significant amount of middle class voters across the country who traditionally would have voted for the Conservatives, um, including in the Tory heartland in the South East, as well as maintaining the support of the majority of the working class. So they're able to reach out to middle class voters while still maintaining support of a lot of working class voters. And they were able to do so because um, Blair shifted Labour Party policy significantly to the centre and successfully presented the party um, as economically competent. Rational choice and issue voting was therefore um, very important. As Labour leader, as I said, Blair drove forward the policy of modernisation and abandoned old fashioned party policies such as nationalisation, tax increases um, and strengthening trade union powers, which might have previously put off middle class voters. He also gave off reassuring, um, reassuring for middle class voters, uh, especially tough signs on law and order, um, an issue that matters to voters after rising crime rates, crime rates in the early 1990s, and emphasised his links to the business community, again, shifting the party um, more to the centre. Tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime was quite, quite a key um, slogan that he used in order to show his strong law and order stance. As a sign of the party's desire to show how responsible it was, its 1997 platform manifesto um, stressed specific policy details and areas in which it promised to make a difference, So, and which would be really tangible to people's lives. So, for example, reducing primary school class sizes and cutting hospital waiting lists um, and waiting times in A&E, for example, to um, four, four hours maximum. Another of Labour's policies, constitutional reform, gave the party significant common ground with the Lib Dems, which made it easier for the Lib Dems to vote tactically for Labour in marginal seats um, and vice versa, um, which may have added up to 30 seats to the Labour majority and really taken quite a few seats away from the Conservatives, enabling Labour's landslide. Ultimately, there was no stark difference um, between Labour and the Conservatives in terms of actual policy due to the Labour Party moving to the centre, um, but the parties had very different images, um, especially due to balance factors. One of these balance factors, leadership, was really important. So Blair was very popular around the country and was seen as a strong, competent and charismatic leader um, with a clear vision and real control over his party, which contrasted with John Major, who was seen as weak, boring and presiding over a party that was really divided over Europe and tainted by um, sleaze scandals um, in the 1990s, including the cash for question scandal, um, which I talk a bit more about in the um, pressure groups and lobbyists um, video on the politics of Spain video. Politics Spain YouTube channel, sorry, if you want to have a look at that. Other balance factors, so perceived competence was also really important, and Labour couldn't have won on such a large scale without the damage the Tories had done to themselves um, after the 1992 election. So turnout was relatively low at 71.4%, um, which meant that under 31% of the registered electorate actually voted for Labour, uh, which doesn't suggest this mass popular movement in support of Labour, Instead, it kind of suggests a move away from the Conservatives. Um, and the result can therefore only be fully explained by looking at the failures of Major's government. And key to that was perceived economic incompetence um, in relation to Black Wednesday. So by 1997, the economy was recovering from the recession of the early part of the decade. But voters didn't give the Conservatives credit for this, as they'd um, wrecked their reputation for economic competence with the catastrophe of Black Wednesday in September 1992. Um, in which, in a day, there were significant increases in interest rates um, and significant um, economic um, not great, significant economic instability. And since then, um, monthly opinion polls showed that Labour were consistently ahead of the Conservatives from autumn 1992 when Black's Wednesday happened. Um, and as I said, the Conservatives have lost their reputation as competent managers of the economy and failed to retrieve it. Given this context, Labour successfully positioned themselves as an economically competent party, pledging not to increase income taxes and to prioritise national finances. And again, therefore, showing the kind of interaction um, with rational choice voting um, and issue based voting. In terms of the media, the media can also be seen as really important, um, as Labour won the endorsement of the greater part of the press, including The Sun and The Times. 
And the key message was that New Labour is a moderate party with the interests of Middle England at heart. So, for example, um, the sun backs Blair was quite a key headline um, in the run-up to the election. In terms of social factors, Labour gained among most groups in the population, among most social factors. They gained in most regions, um, in uh, Scotland, Wales, and London, for example, though the Tories kept their um, dominance in the southeast. They gained among most classes, especially the middle classes, and they won among white voters and among BME voters. So in terms of the key points, um, key was the ability of New Labour to win middle class voters. Um, and rational choice and issue voting was important to this, with Labour moving their policy to occupy the centre ground, so policy can be seen as really important. The Conservatives have wrecked their image as a party of economic competence. Um, leadership was very important, so both of those balance factors can be seen as very important. Um, and the media can be seen as important as, important as well, um, with Labour benefiting from winning the support of significant sections of the press, which traditionally supported the Conservative Party. So, now, 13 years um, later, the next um, case study I've got is the 2010 general election. In terms of an overview of the general election result and its impact, um, Brown and Labour were removed from office, ending the new Labour era, to be replaced by a coalition between the Tories and the Lib Dems, which is the first coalition, um, formal coalition at least, in uh, the post-war period. Cameron's Conservatives increased their share of seats, benefiting from four um, years of efforts of modernisation and moving the party away um, from the kind of toxic image of Thatcherism, um, and went on to win a slender majority in the next election in 2015. Against predictions, the coalition survived a full term, partly due to the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, um, on which the, the Lib Dems had insisted. In terms of the result, there was a turnout of 65.1%, and the coalition had a majority of 77, though of course the Conservatives didn't have a majority themselves, which is why they went into a coalition. And the Conservatives got 36.1% of the popular vote um, and 306 seats. Labour got 29% of the popular vote and 258 seats. And the Lib Dems received 23% of the vote, but again, due to the um, first past the post electoral system in which minor parties are disadvantaged, um, they won just 57 seats. In terms of the key factors determining the outcome, the campaign and TV debates can be seen as really important. On the Labour side, much was made of Brown's um, unscripted voting, unscripted meeting, sorry, with a voter um, in Rochdale. And after she embarrassed him with a hostile question about immigration, a radio microphone picked him up, describing her as a bigoted woman um, while being driven away in his, his car. Um, and this incident was really seized on by the media. On the other hand, it can be seen as relatively unimportant. Um, because Labour was already behind in the polls, and Labour was ultimately um, able to hold Rochdale, despite this incident. Um, key to the 2010 election campaign, what really separated it, um, or went different from previous elections, were the, was the decision to hold TV debates featuring the three main leaders. In these, Brown came across as quite wooden, um, and kind of consistently agreed with Nick Clegg, with much was made of his, his him consistently saying, I agree with Nick. Um, and... Following them, Clegg and the Lib Dems experienced a boost in opinion polls. Ultimately, however, this fell back again um, before um, polling day. So on the one hand, the media and these um, the campaign and TV debates can be seen as important. On the other hand, it perhaps shouldn't be overstated. Valence and leadership were also important. Um, so Cameron and the Conservatives focused their attacks on Labour's alleged mismanagement of the economy, accusing them of reckless overspending and a failure to regulate the banking system effectively. Um, which gained considerable traction with the electorate, um, with one opinion poll um, showing that 59% of voters agreed that most of the extra money spent by the Labour government had been wasted. When Brown became PM, he also um, kind of briefly encouraged speculation and potentially looked like he would call an autumn election in 2007 in order to secure a personal mandate. But when he decided not to do so, he was wild, widely ridiculed for alleged cowardice um, and his reputation never really fully recovered. And he was also presented in the media as being quite wooden and a, a bit of a workaholic and not a very kind of popular leader for the Labour Party. By contrast, Cameron was relatively popular, um, especially compar in comparison to the Tory party leaders that came before him. And an Ipsos Mori poll shortly before the election showed that 33% regarded Cameron as the most capable PM compared to 29% for Brown. So that could be used to suggest that leadership is important, but overall, still actually not that much of a difference um, in this. 
Though many independent commentators had commended Brown for his emergency action he took following the 2008 financial crash, and he was seen as kind of dealing with that very effectively, he received little credit um, from the media or the public. Another factor is the relative unimportance of policy and policy difference, as there was actually little policy difference between the three main parties who agreed on the need to reduce the budget deficit, um, which had increased to £163 billion following the 2008 financial crash. So all three parties pledged to make savings um, without sacrificing, sacrificing essential public services, but the difference was in the timing and extent of the cuts, um, with the Tories calling for immediate cuts compared to Labour and the Lib Dems arguing that would jeopardise um, the fragile recovery of the economy from recession um, and that the cuts should be phased in gradually. Overall, though, these um, policy differences can be seen as quite limited and unimportant um, and therefore kind of rational choice and policy can be seen as having less impact um, on the general election result. In terms of the wider political and economic context, the 2008 financial crash um, and the consequent recession dominated the election and was important in decreasing the Labour Party's um, popularity among the electorate and clouding their previous economic achievements. So in terms of key points, leadership can be seen as important. Um, the wider economic context um, and how this influenced the perceived incompetence of Labour can be seen as important. Policy can be seen as relatively unimportant. Um, and the campaign had some key events um, but and could be argued to be important, but on the other hand, could also be argued to be overall relatively unimportant. OK, so the final two elections I'm going to look at are the 2017 election and the 2019 election. So in terms of the 2017 election, um, it was called by Theresa May, um, who had become Conservative Party leader in 2016. Um, and in the spring of 2017, called an election with the aim of improving the Conservative Party's small majority, as they were ahead um, over Labour in opinion polls. This ultimately failed, uh, um, resulting in the Conservative Party losing its majority and having to enter a confidence and supply agreement with the DUP in order to stay in power. The Conservatives won 42.4% of the vote and 318 seats. Labour won 40% of the vote and 262 seats. Um, whilst the SNP won 3% of the vote and 35 seats, and the Lib Dems won 7.4% of the vote and just 12 seats. And there was therefore a significant shift from 2015 and 2010 um, back to the two main parties. As especially in 2015, there had been a shift um, away from the two main parties with the, well, not with the Lib Dems continuing to do well, but the SNP did really well and cleaned up in Scotland, um, and UKIP, for example, received um, a significant amount of votes. In terms of the key factors determining the outcome, the first one could be seen as leadership. So May was perceived as being a weak leader, whilst Corbyn was able to take advantage of this through being very popular among certain sections of the population, especially the young. May was derided for refusing to take part in the leaders' debate, um, which made her look weak, and her strong and stable leadership message also gained little traction, um, especially when kind of failing to appear in that leadership debate. In terms of policy and rational choice voting, this can be seen as important, as Corbyn and Labour gained significant support due to their policies to end austerity, improve welfare, and scrap university tuition fees. After seven years of Tory government, Corbyn was able to offer a real change and e increased funding that would have helped a lot of people. Recent terrorist attacks also affected the Tories and highlighted cuts to police numbers made since coming to power in 2010. In terms of the campaign, the campaign can be seen as quite important, um, as it started with the Tories significantly ahead in the polls, um, but ended with Labour being able to gain significant ground, despite how a lot of the press presented Corbyn negatively. A key point in the campaign um, was when Theresa May announced plans to change social care, so that so those receiving care at home would also have to contribute to the cost of their care. Um, it was dubbed by the media as the dementia tax and received a massive backlash, leading to the Conservative Party uh, and Theresa May having to drop it after 24 hours and do a U-turn on that policy. In terms of social factors, Corbyn and Labour received very strong support from younger voters, um, whilst the Conservatives were more popular with older voters. So as I mentioned earlier in the video, age, a really key factor in um, determining voting behaviour. Education was also significant, um, as I mentioned earlier in the video, and class became a less useful predictor of voting behaviour, with the Conservatives gaining among the working class and Labour, Labour gaining among the middle class, despite Corbyn's shift um, left in terms of policy. So in terms of key points, again, leadership was quite a key factor, uh, rational choice and policy 
can be seen as important, um, with Corbyn offering an alternative vision. Um, the campaign can be seen as important, especially in comparison to other elections, um, whilst age and education became key as social factors. So, finally, looking at the 2019 general election, which was called um, in December by Boris Johnson in order to try and secure support for the withdrawal agreement he'd negotiated with the EU. So that was his Brexit agreement. The current parliament wasn't passing it, so he felt he had to go to the country um, and get the country's mandate in order to pass it. The Conservative Party led with the slogan, Get Brexit Done, and ultimately did so very successfully, um, as it was the last first landslide election in nearly 20 years since 1997, with the Conservatives winning an 80-seat majority with 43.6% of the vote, the highest percentage of any party since Thatcher was first elected in 1979. The Conservatives' gains were in large part due to their ability to break the Red Wall in the North, um, so that was Labour heart, traditional Labour heartlands in the North. Labour won just 202, a seat, 202 seats, which is its lowest since 1935, with 40% of the vote. And the election effectively ended hope um, for remaining in the EU and resulted in Jeremy Corbyn's resignation and the end of Corbynism in the Labour Party, um, or at least the end of Corbynism in, in the leadership of the Labour Party. The Lib Dems increased their vote share um, to 11.6%, but won just 11 seats. And that included their leader, Joe Swinson, who failed to win her seat. In terms of key factors determining the outcome, issue voting and competence can be seen as really important. So Brexit was without, do without doubt the key issue of the election and had a major impact on the result. With the Conservative Party, as I said, leading with the slogan, Get Brexit Done, whilst the Labour Party supported a second referendum on Brexit. As a result, Labour, um, sorry, the Tories were able to win 74% um, of Leave voters in the 2016 um, referendum, whilst 49% of those who had voted Remain voted for Labour, with a lot of other Remain voters voting for the Lib Dems. Elsewhere in policy, Labour was seen as far too radical and not trusted with the economy, due to its very left-wing manifesto um, that included major spending pledges and six big nationalisations. Um, and Corbyn was presented and seen by many as unfit to govern. For a bit more detail on that, look at the Labour Party video on the Politics Explained YouTube channel. Both parties pledged to, to end austerity, but Labour pledged to increase spending by a lot more than the Conservatives did. Leadership was also, also certainly key, um, with Corbyn presented as an unprecedented, well, not presented, but Corbyn was an unprecedentedly unpopular leader, with many former Labour voters citing this as the key reason why they switched their vote. The fact he took no position on Brexit um, was seen as weak, whilst he was heavily criticised for, for allowing anti-Semitism to grow in the Labour Party. The media was very critical of Corbyn and helped to fuel his unpopularity. Boris Johnson was also, on, on the other hand, very popular and able to reach beyond the Conservative Party's core vote to many working class voters in a way that few Conservatives um, would have been able to do. The campaign could be seen as having little impact on the result of the election, um, as the Conservative Party started with the dominant lead in the polls and it never really wavered. Boris Johnson and the Tories um, tried to focus almost exclusively on Brexit, um, with kind of consistently repeating get Brexit done. Um, and Labour unsuccessfully um, tried to move the focus away from Brexit onto their economic proposals. There were a few possible events um, that could have influenced the result, such as a picture of a young boy having to sleep on the, fl on the floor in a hospital, um, which could have har harmed the Conservatives. Um, but the Conservative lead in the polling, Conservatives lead in polling remained relatively steady throughout. So the campaign can be seen as relatively important, unimportant. In terms of the media, there were two TV debates between the leaders but neither had much of a significant impact. And Corbyn and Labour were harmed by an interview Corbyn had with Andrew Neil, in which he performed poorly. And Johnson ultimately um, refused to do an interview with Andrew Neil in the run-up to the election, despite having previously agreed to do so. Corbyn was presented extremely negatively um, by large parts of the media, especially the right-wing press, and that can be seen as relatively important as well. In terms of social factors, traditional class associations played little role with the Tories able to win um, significant numbers of working class votes um, due in large part to Brexit. There were also key regional shifts, though, um, with the Conservative Party breaking the Red Wall and winning many northern seats, which were, which were traditionally Labour heartlands, whilst maintaining their dominance in the southeast and rural areas. The SNP's dominance in Scotland was strengthened, winning 48 out of 56 seats. Agent 
uh, education continued to be really key social factors in predicting the outcome as they had been in 2017. In terms of key points for 2019, therefore, issue voting on Brexit um, was important to the result. Leadership played an important role, especially Corbyn's unpopularity. The campaign had little impact on the result, and age and education continued to be important social factors, whilst there was a key regional shift in uh, the former record. So finally, obviously it hasn't happened yet, but just quick, quickly looking at some potential factors that could be important in um, the next election, which is likely to be in 2024. Um, so can't really predict this yet, right? Um, but there are some factors that could be seen, um, could likely be quite important. The first one of these is the wider political and economic context. And that's um, the kind of COVID, right? Um, and party gets. So since the 2019 election, the Conservative Party has lost significant support due to the mishandling of COVID, the party gate scandal, and Liz Truss's failed economic reforms um, in the um, autumn and winter of 2022, which have contributed to the current cost of living crisis. These may therefore be crucial in the next election if Labour are able to win, as current polls suggest they might do. Competence and leadership may also be very important. So Rishi Sunak is a relatively unpopular leader for the Conservatives, while Starmer is becoming increasingly popular due to his perceived competence and experience, especially in comparison to the Conservatives' perceived incompetence. Um, and that's because this perceived incompetence of the Conservatives is due to its performance in the last three years in office, especially under Liz Truss, um, though she was only there for 45 days. Um, she did kind of, or kind of her and Kwasi Karteng, especially um, their economic policies had quite a negative impact, um, or a very negative impact in causing a, a drop in the value of the pound, and therefore a loss um, of the reputation of being economically competent for the Conservative Party. Rational choice and issue voting may also be important, um, as Starmer significantly um, shifted the Labour Party back to the centre, as Blair did in 1997, um, which may enable the party to have a broader appeal than Corbyn was able to in 2019. The Conservative Party will likely continue to try and gain support through tough immigration policies and cultural war issues, um, as well as trying to regain the image of being economically competent through prioritizing, prioritizing national finances, though it's quite likely to be too little too late. In terms of social factors, um, current polling suggests that the Labour Party may regain its dominance in the Red Wall and other traditional strongholds such as parts of Wales. So, that's all the content. I know that was a very long video, um, but as I said, you don't need to know all of those case studies. It's just kind of, they can be, it just depends on which ones you studied in class, right? Um, obviously, I think it would be useful to learn all of them um, in terms of having a range of examples to use in your essays. Um, so that's why I've covered all of them as well. So finally, look at, looking at um, some practice um, or potential essay questions for this topic and how you could potentially answer them. So first, looking at evaluate the view that media support is the most inf important factor for a political party to achieve success. In that, you could have one paragraph on the media with for and against arguments. Look at the media video on the Politics Explained YouTube channel for a bit more detail on that and, and bring in those examples um, from the case studies I just went through um, on the media. And in terms of the other paragraphs in there, you could do potentially... Um, social factors which act as quite a good counter to the media as they're more long-term factors um, and you can also cover um, potentially longer term issue factors or another group of factors. Um, in terms of the relative importance of different demographic factors um, in voting behaviour that's that kind of um, third question in bold there. Um, for that um, you could do a kind of a range of social factors right I'd, I'd suggest doing kind of age and education, possibly, because they're quite key social factors. You could potentially look at class as another paragraph um, due to its, and kind of note its declining importance and how it used to be very important. Um, and then potentially could do a third paragraph on, um, so you could do two on, one on age, one on, eth one on education, or you could do another paragraph on um, region or ethnicity. So effectively you could just pick a few, three social factors and do paragraphs on them, or kind of pick more than three and combine them um, some of them to, to get into three paragraphs, do four and against paragraphs for each of them um, and weigh up their impact at the end in the conclusion and kind of throughout the essay as well. Um, in terms of evaluate the extent to which election campaigns in influence the outcome of the vote, um, election campaigns could be one paragraph um, and combine that with elements of kind of how the media influences campaigns as well. And then in terms of other paragraphs, you could potentially do one on social factors um, and then another one on longer term issue factors such as rational choice, issue based voting. Um, and then kind of this, this first one's a bit more difficult, evaluate 
um, the extent to which general elections in the UK are lost by the government rather than won by the opposition. In that, you're more likely to be kind of, you need to really focus a bit more on case studies um, and some of the kind of arguments, key arguments you could use for um, loss by the government is kind of the role of um, scandals um, and key events in a loss of a view of competence. Um, for example, Black Wednesday in the run up to the 1997 election. Um, for example, more recently, right, um, you could look at Liz Truss's loss of um, support um, and potentially looking at the 2010 election as well. In terms of some arguments for won by the opposition, you could look at how oppositions have successfully changed their policies in order to win um, power, such as um, 1997 being a really key um, example of that. But then you could look at how that's also failed, um, for example, in, in 2017 and 2019, with the Conservatives still staying in power, despite Corbyn shifting um, party policy significantly. Um, so, yeah. Lots of different arguments you could bring into that essay, but mainly it would be focused on those case studies. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much pretty much it. In terms of, as I said at the start of the video, I'm going to be making, um, there are going to be essay plans, detailed essay plans I'm going to be making for each of these um, questions in bold on the Politics Explained um, website, which you should be able to purchase. Um, and on there, as I said, there's also a lot of other important and useful resources you could use. Um, that could be really helpful in your politics A level, as well as a place to sign up for tutoring and, and some group classes if that's something you'd be interested in. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Feel free to drop any questions or comments in the comment section below and I'll get back to you and I'll see you in the next video.